My name's John, I'm from Valve. Uh, we've been working for a couple of years now on a Debian derivative called SteamOS, or SteamOS, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, I've been at Valve for a couple of years, and one thing I've found uh, when I tell people I work there is there's two reactions. Some people have no idea what Valve is or what they do, and some people are incredibly passionately excited about Valve. Uh, if you're in the first category, Valve has been around since 1996. It was originally started to develop PC games, mainly focused on, on uh, Windows PCs. We have a wide uh, list of PC games, some on, mainly on Windows, uh, also Mac and Linux now, but originally started on Windows, and a few of them on consoles as well. Uh, some you've heard of, some maybe you haven't. But uh, uh, anyway, that's how Valve got to start. But along the way, we developed this uh, platform called Steam. Started off just as a way to update our games, turned into an application store for PC games, social network, messaging. Uh, now it's a huge community. Uh, over 75 million active users logging into Steam, playing games, communicating with their friends. Thousands of games support on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So one thing that a few years ago Valve saw was open platforms are really important. The way we work at Valve is we put stuff out there, listen to our customers, iterate on things quickly, listen to our feedback, and try to give our customers what they want. Right, The things they like, we'll do more of that. Things they don't like, well, we'll stop doing that. And uh, open platforms, the ability for people to run whatever they want on their computers, uh, modify games, create their own content, really breeds that innovation, that kind of uh, people do stuff you'd never expect when you give them you know, the keys to their own car. And uh, they can sometimes crash to the wall, and sometimes they do amazing, great things. Uh, and uh, one thing that's been a trend lately over the last years we've noticed is a lot of platforms now are not becoming less open. Uh, you have consoles where you have to go through, you know, what the console manufacturer to get your software on that box. You have the iOS and Android app stores, and even on the traditional PC platforms like Windows and OS X, you're seeing these gated communities of app stores. Uh, so, Val, we wanted to understand what's that? How do we how do we think about that? How do we counter that effect and build our own platform at the same time? We're thinking about how we can get into the living room, take the games people enjoy on their desktops, bring them to the couch, the 10-foot environment, so they can enjoy those on their big screen TVs, just like a console today. And this required a lot of work across a lot of different parts of Steam and uh, the games versus the, the big picture sort of living room experience. The same interface you want on your desktop, we call a two-foot experience with a mouse and a keyboard, isn't appropriate when you're sitting on your couch watching your 65-inch TV on the wall. Uh, so we have a whole new UI for Steam, designed to be operated with a controller from a 10-foot, very big pictures, very big motions. Steam in-home streaming is a way that we can take your Windows games that don't run on Linux, run them remotely. We actually stream the UI, stream the uh, input over the network, whether wireless or a wired network, to a Linux PC. Uh, and you can play that Windows-only game on your Linux box and actually get a great experience out of it. It's, you know, a lot of people don't think this is going to work, but they tried, and it's, it's almost magical in a way how well it works. I personally was pretty surprised at the, how good the experience is. We've gotten the latency down really low. It's a very high-quality gaming experience. Family sharing for letting people with multiple Steam accounts share the same Steam account. If I buy a game on my account, other people in my family can play it on the same box. And then uh, the Steam controller is an effort that's been going on for a long time. It's really one of the pillars of, of our Steam machine. And that's a way to make it possible to play these keyboard-centric PC games with a controller. You know, a traditional controller isn't going to work very well with these games. They're designed to be played with a mouse and keyboard. So we've done some innovative stuff around touch pads and uh, adaptive binding of controller buttons to keyboard to make a really good experience there. And that's something that's ongoing. And then, of course, we wanted to bring all this stuff to Linux so we could have an open platform where people could do whatever they wanted with the box. We could sort of develop our own community of people experimenting and taking this platform in ways we didn't expect. So that started out with Steam for Linux, porting games to Linux, both Valve games and other companies' games. And then finally, SteamOS, which is the Debian uh, distribution that we've developed at Valve. And then finally, pulling it all together onto the Steam machines which will be shipping as a bundled piece of hardware. So Steam for Linux goal was to take all the stuff we got on Steam, deliver that same great gaming experience onto Linux desktops. Originally focused on Ubuntu 1204 LTS, the time that was by far the predominant 
desktop Linux distribution. Uh, but we had, uh, as you may have heard from Linus last night, a real problem with binary compatibility. How do we take you know, one product, Steam, and all the games that run on Steam and make those run across a whole set of distributions? Uh, it's really hard. There's not a good, good way to do it. You're, there's no way you're going to rebuild all these games for every different distribution. Uh, what we ended up doing was creating what we call the Steam Runtime. Uh, that's uh, a, a very similar to Ubuntu 1204 binary system. We lay that down and we uh, run all the games on top of that user space. And so far that's been pretty successful. We've targeted all our partners to run their games on top of the Steam Runtime. Steam itself runs on top of that. And we maintain that set of binaries across the set of distributions and going forward we'll guarantee binary compatibility for those games. And this was released uh, about six months ago. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say there's uh, over 600 Linux games now on Steam that you can download and run on your Linux box, which is pretty amazing when you consider where we started from. Okay, now we have Steam for Linux that's out there. We've got uh, a third party porting their games to Steam. We've got a good uh, installed base. We've got streaming so we can bring your Windows games to Steam. The next step was really build out our own living room platform called SteamOS. Make it consumer friendly, something that anybody could buy, you know, whether at your local hardware store or order on the internet. Give you great Steam performance. It's really tuned, uh, latest and greatest graphics drivers, high end, high end systems that can compete with a console, an Xbox One or a PS4. Provide a great streaming client. If you have existing Windows games you want to play on your big screen, this is a great way to do that. Connect this box to your TV and you're done. Off you go. The you know, main goal main distribution channel for this is going to be through our partners, through our OEMs, people selling Steam machines, pre-installed a, uh, a full bundle with Steam OS, the Steam controller, and the Steam machine. But it is an open platform. Uh, it's not a lockdown box. If you want to you know, get to the desktop and install whatever you want on it, you want to develop your own software for it, it's wide open. It's, it's really Debian underneath, uh, something everybody in this room is, is familiar with, I'm sure. And people can do and have done pretty interesting things with that platform. Things that it's not, I always think it's important to understand what it is you're not doing or else you end up doing everything. Um, it's not a great de desktop. It's a terrible Linux desktop. People want to use it as a Linux desktop. It's never designed to be that. We have a desktop system, but it's really a placeholder. It's a bare bones thing. Um, uh, I don't encourage people to install this and use it as their daily workstation. There's plenty of Linux desktops out there already that do that. Well, it's not really going to play in that space. Some people want to boot, boot it with Windows. Again, and that's something that maybe is an interesting exercise, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a product perspective. Uh, if you already have Windows and Steam on your desktop PC, that's great. Why would you also want SteamOS on there? Um, to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We haven't invested a lot of time in that. Uh, some people do do it, but mainly just to prove it can be done. Uh, again, uh, and because it's an OEM product designed to be sold through the hardware channel, it's not really designed to be installed by end users. They're not going to be faced with a Debian installer kind of experience to put this on their box. It'll come out of the box with a full 10-foot uh, experience, and they'll never see the install process underneath. VM client, people like to run, try or try to run SteamOS in a VM because uh, we really depend on the 3D accelerated graphics very heavily in OpenGL. It's never going to be a good experience running this in a VM client today. The 3D graphics is just not there yet. Someday perhaps, but uh, not yet. And older hardware is also another thing that uh, is not really a target for us. You know, people pull, I have this old laptop lying around, I want to put SteamOS on it. It's not going to be a great experience. We really haven't spent much time on that and we really don't plan to. Uh, these are going to be pretty uh, new hardware, new boxes, new drivers. Some of the changes we made within Steam mainly focused around consumerization. Uh, we have automatic updates uh, using the standard apt and unattended upgrades package set up to update it at, boot at uh, shutdown time. So the user never has to say, oh geez, there's updates, I gotta do this, I gotta do updates or whatever. Just in, within Steam they see a notification, they need to reboot their computer to apply updates, applies them automatically and it's done. Uh, it's, it's not a opt-in thing like it is in some operating systems. Uh, it's out of the box, it's gonna stay up to date. It's going to be updated regularly. We'll stay on top of security patches and such like that. Improve the graphical boot. The whole experience from the firmware up through the initial load of Steam has been uh, tuned. We work with our firmware partners to make sure that uh, they get a, a good, consistent experience. They don't see 
text flying by or random mode switches or things flying in and out of the screen. Um, I just see Steam coming up and, and I boot right into the Steam logon screen. And it's all controller friendly. The initial boot, you know, you go through the whole thing, selecting your time zone, your language, whatever, that's all controller driven. You don't ever need a keyboard or mouse attached to this box to get the thing installed, to get it up and running, get logged in. The other thing we've done that's a little interesting is some work in, in X to enable a separate Steam session, which is just Steam running in big picture, and a desktop session with a traditional GNOME desktop. And you can turn on that, that desktop experience and switch back and forth between them on the fly. So the graphic stack obviously is something we care a lot about uh, for performance reasons, uh, for the hardware reasons where we do expect to be using the latest and greatest hardware from our partners. Uh, we need to have the latest and greatest drivers to take advantage of that. Um, so we had we work very closely with them, We've, and uh, as well as the seamless boot and shutdown sequences I've, I've mentioned. You know that requires the firmware to do the right thing, requires the grub bootloader to do the right thing, requires the graphics driver to do the right thing. So there's changes throughout the whole stack to make that all work seamlessly. Uh, we spent some time working on, on Mesa to get better Intel integrated graphics support. That's a really important price point for us because that's kind of the lowest price point. And it's a very price sensitive area, so we want to do the best we can to get the best graphics performance out of that part we can. And we're working again with AMD and NVIDIA to make sure that we have the latest of their drivers. <coughs> we're closely with them on graphics performance in the various games. Make sure if there's any issues, we can address it and we can roll out newer drivers. This is what you see when you boot up a SteamOS machine, assuming it's, it's been correctly configured by the OEM. You get the native TV timings. The firmware is responsible for figuring out what the right settings are, setting that up, and handing that off to EFI. And then that flows all the way through. That mode flows all the way through to Steam and the initial Steam experience. So if you're used to the kind of janky in and out mode switching black screens, in between we've done a lot of work to, to uh, pay that out and make sure it looks just like one simple system booting up. The full screen graphics environment, this is a, another interesting work we've done with a, our own uh, composition manager. There's, there's really only one application running in SteamOS generally when you're running in the Steam environment and that's either Steam or the game. So you always get full screen. If, you, if the game tries to put up a, a small window, it'll be scaled so it looks full screen. We do our own custom compositing here. Um, redirect the, uh, the mouse input to the right window and make sure that uh, if you have an app that hangs, there's a Steam overlay. We can always bring that overlay up because it's running out of process and it's integrated with a composition manager. You can bring the overlay up, kill that app, and return back into Steam. That's something we couldn't do uh, in just a, a standard uh, um, Linux or even Windows environment where you have to be in the application process to put up that overlay. The Mesa driver, this is something where we've done a lot of work uh, working with a company called Lunar G. They have a lot of open jail graphics expertise um, to really update the Mesa that, that is in uh, Debian Wheezy to something that can run our games and run the other games and be really performant on the latest Intel hardware. So we've cherry-picked patches and uh, funded them to actually implement some new performance-focused features in Mesa. This is all uh, open source on the, our GitHub. You can go up there. You can see uh, the branch that we're using in SteamOS today. Uh, submit patches, uh, whatever you want. Uh, and this is something we think is, is going to be really important for the Intel-based graphics to get that uh, competitive. Our Linux kernel, again, because we want to be able to run with a, the newest hardware, we've updated our Linux kernel. It's based on the 310 long-term branch. Um, we have various hardware drivers as our partners come and say, hey, we're shipping this platform with this wireless part that's not supported. We'll work with, with them and with a wireless card vendor to integrate that driver into our kernel and ship it. We've improved, obviously, the, the Xbox 360 controller support, so it's seamless out-of-the-box support, just plug in your Xbox 360 controller and we detect it and go with it. And hopefully this is something we can collaborate with our hardware partners over time to uh, get patches in, in our kernel to support their hardware. Um, are all those improvements, like especially the controller support, are those going upstream to kernel and Xorg? 
Um, the controller support specifically, I believe, we've sent upstream. Pierre Lee would know because he did it. <laughs> yeah, the, the patches have been sent upstream. Uh, there's been some discussion, uh, as always, when you send something upstream. So eventually it will make its way there in some shape or form, hopefully. And a lot of the hardware support packages we've actually pulled from upstream, backport into our kernel uh, to get the newer hardware support in our older kernel. <coughs> So I'll talk a little bit about the build and release process. You know, SteamOS, I think, just from going to some of the uh, discussions here, is a little bit different than some of the other Debian derivatives we've talked to. Uh, now, we've, we've actually rebuilt all the Debian packages from source. Um, we use a system called OBS, Open Build System. Open Build System, is that right? <laughs> Cloudware helped us set this up, and uh, it's worked out really well for us to pull in changes, pull in new packages, build them, and deploy them. Um, we also have a, another system called merge matic that looks at the upstreams. If there's a security patch upstream or some newer release upstream from us, it'll automatically merge in that patch, submit a request to OBS. We can just approve it. Boom, it goes in, gets rebuilt in our system, pushes out to our repository where we can then do our own testing if we need to of that. And the way that we do our release process, uh, we modeled our SteamOS release process off the Steam client release process. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, the way it works is there's a beta channel that updates pretty regularly. We try to be on like a one week update cadence uh, for the last six months or so on SteamOS. Uh, we'll push out changes pretty regularly. They're maybe not very well tested. People who can opt into that beta channel, test it, give us feedback. Uh, after we feel like we've got what's in that beta channel is, is stable, getting good feedback from our customers, they'll get promoted to the release uh, channel, which is where everybody will then get that update. Uh, so we have, you know, early adopter, people want to be on the bleeding edge, can opt into this and, you know, we might break you, we might break your video driver. I think we just broke some people's sound drivers last week. Uh, we'll try to address all those uh, issues before we promote that to, to Alchemist. And then recently we've moved to the same model with a Steam runtime, which is a binary compatibility layer that the uh, um, uh, games will target and we'll be updating that in the same way where we'll have a beta and once we feel like we have good coverage on the games and, and maybe do a formal test pass, uh, that'll get promoted to release. Uh, that's something that, that updates much less frequently. We, we try not to touch that Steam runtime unless we have to. But SteamOS, we, we do, we have been rolling out pretty frequent regular updates right now. I think once we ship and have real hardware, that cadence will slow, slow a bit until it's just uh, probably critical security patches, maybe new drivers every six months or so. Not really sure what the cadence of that is going to be, and we we'll sort of play that by ear a little. But that process uh, has worked pretty well for us. So this is in general what uh, our build workflow looks like. We have, you know, most of our packages come out of Wheezy. A few we've we've taken from Jesse that are newer versions we needed for one reason or other. And Mergematica basically monitors those every day on a daily basis, detects any changes that are different from what we have, automatically tries to merge them and pull them in and submit them into our OBS. We have a few packages on GitHub, like the kernel, the Mesa library I, I discussed, uh, which is, today is a pretty manual process to, to bring that GitHub source into, into OBS and build it. And similarly, we have a few internal packages that are maintained in an internal Perforce system that Valve uses, and uh, those also flow into OBS in the same way. When OBS builds them, they go into what we call the SteamOS master repository, which is always the latest and greatest things that have been built on the build system. And the next step is to take those and propagate those out uh, to somewhere where we can test them in a way that uh, our customers will test them. So the first step is, is what you, we use rep repro heavily to, to move stuff around between the various repos. We have an internal repository of Alchemist Beta. The first step is to prop out the stuff to there, and then we can do some internal testing within Valve, just using that repository, update our systems, point them at that repo, make sure everything works. Once we feel like, okay, we've done the testing we need to, the targeted testing based on the changes we need to know, we, we know we've made, or based on, you know, just general smoke tests, we can we push that out. Um, we can pull that out to our, our internal global repository, uh, which is the main release repository. And from there, we, we can, then we use rsync to basically replicate our internal repository out onto the internet, and that's when everybody can uh, get the same bits that we're testing internally. 
And the R sync from internal to external happens both when we prop an external beta and when we prop an external release. It's always just a, basically a mirror copy from our internal repository to the external one. So what's next? Uh, we're kind of in a state, uh, uh, you know, we've got a lot of hardware in flight right now and, and uh, trying to make sure all those parts line up before we can ship steam machines out to the real world, uh, we'll respond to some feedback, uh, enable the hardware that our partners need enabled. And then looking past our V1, which is going to ship on the first hardware that comes out, what do we do next? Uh, I'm really interested in, in moving a, uh, away from an app-based update to more of an image-based update system. Uh, we see this like with the Chromebooks. We see this, I think, uh, some other Ubuntu seems to be moving towards this. Uh, Read-only image that's applied across everybody's machines is always the same and be able to roll that image forward in a more consistent way. Um, that gives you a, a real control over what's on the bits that are on everybody's machine. You can roll the things back, move to a different image very easily in a way you can't do with app today. Uh, you can do it atomically as well if you're clever. Uh, but it sort of takes away some of the control that people have over their machine, being able to install arbitrary things, being able to install their own <laughs> packages. So figuring out what's the right trade-off there between having a consistent consumer class appliance uh, and being able to service that and being able to have a, a platform that people can do arbitrary things with and still get a, get a great experience. Uh, that's something I don't think we, anybody has solved quite yet. Uh, we're, we're looking at a couple things for the next release in that area. Improving the desktop experience, you know, what we have there is basically a bare bones GNOME desktop. Uh, it's not by any means a great experience. It's a good way to open a terminal window and install some other stuff. Uh, it'd be interesting, I think, to, to figure out what does a 10-foot TV-centric desktop look like. I don't think there's anything really out there today that uh, gives a kind of a power user experience, ability to control your system at a fine level. Um, but we don't have one today. I don't know if we'll build one or if the community will build one or, or whatever, but I think it's a pretty interesting area. A long-term binary compatibility uh, with the Steam runtime, that's been working pretty well for us so far. Uh, it's a little limited. I'm not sure exactly how we'll move that kind of binary level forward to take advantage of new libraries and things. Uh, whether we'll just add stuff into the existing one or whether we'll have multiple runtimes and, and apps can opt into that. Looking at some of the work that's going on in containerization and being able to isolate things from each other, I think that's there's a really interesting area there for us to provide a consistent binary compatibility environment that we can maintain across multiple distributions as a target for people who want to deliver a binary application through Steam. Uh, other thing is, is how do we make it easy for people to install stuff that's not through Steam on a, on a Steam machine, right? Uh, there's there's people who don't want to deliver their their application through Steam. They want to do it through their own website, their own channel. There's things that we might not want on Steam for some reason. Uh, how do we make it so people can install that easily? I know there's a bunch of efforts going on starting up now about sandboxed, compatible application, unprivileged things. Uh, and I think it's try to stay on top of that for us and figure out where can we leverage the community and, and coming up with a standard for clicked install sandboxed applications that could work just as well on a Steam machine as they would on a desktop or a phone environment. And then moving to Jesse is something that's on our radar. Alchemist is based on Wheezy. It'll stay based on Wheezy forever. At some point we'll have a new release that'll be based on Jesse. It's going to be a bunch of work there. There's a lot of changes we need to, to um, think about and what's the right thing to do for us uh, and when that will happen. We're still up in the air a bit. <laughs> And thanks, I just want to say I take this opportunity to say thanks to the Debian developers and the Debian community. Uh, we could not have done this without all the work people all over the world and in this room have done. Um, I don't know if people are aware of this, but we have a standing offer. Anybody who's a Debian developer can get a free Valve key on Steam that will unlock all the Valve games for you for free on Steam. Uh, just email debian-steam at collabro.com Mail signed by your key and your key ring, and it can't be a 1024-bit key, right? <laughs> <laughs> so far, I think we've given out 415 keys. So if there's been a, a decline in productivity of Debian developers, <laughs> might be some correlation there. I don't know, but uh, that's it. So if you have other questions, there's some links more information. We have a sort of a general overview of all our Steam living room efforts at, at steampower.com. 
you know, the whole community with forums, questions and, and answers that we monitor on a regular basis on Steam community. We also post any update announcements there in the Steam OS group uh, whenever we, we put out a new beta or, or a new release that goes up there. Uh, you can look on the Valve software GitHub. There's, as well as the stuff I've mentioned, there's some other open source projects from Valve. Um, and of course, if you're interested in working on any of this stuff, Valve hiring. There's some job postings there. Or feel free to email me directly. Great. I think one of the reasons that PC gaming was so successful from the very beginning is that you could use the same PC for work and for games. Uh, the work you're doing on making uh, Steam OS computer uh, easier to boot and easier to manage from uh, with 10 foot UI. Uh, I think it would be useful if you could combine that with a proper working desktop. So I, uh, I think a lot of people would prefer to have their living room PC also be a PC. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you. I personally don't, but uh, I believe some people do. And I know people have, have tried to, you know, install LibreOffice on their Steam OS machine to do spreadsheets from their couch, I guess. Uh, and again, that's something that right now we don't think it's really a thing. Maybe the community will do some stuff in that area, and when we'll pick it up and adopt it. I'm not saying we'll never do it. I'm just it's not super high on our priority list to make this a productivity experience as well as a gaming experience. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'm myself not interested in games, but I'm interested in the fact that others like games, and by that fact would probably come to Debian because you provide games on SteamOS. So what would be, uh, what I would love to see would be people using Debian because they want to play games on SteamOS. So my question would be, uh, what would it take for uh, Valve to bring Steam directly into Debian in a way or another so that it would be one of the possibilities to to play Steam Steam games? Well, I'll, I'll just to clarify, all these games all work today on Debian. And yeah, but like, uh, Steam is you have some other, uh, you do some modification on SteamOS, like uh, you optimize X and and kernel and whatever. Did you think about bringing that directly to Debian? Uh, a lot of the optimizations we've made are kind of specific to the environment we have and not necessarily applicable to Debian at large. Uh, the, you know, things that we think make sense to go upstream, we'll definitely try to push upstream. I, I don't think, uh, maybe Pierre Lou can talk to this one better, but I don't think the patch we've made to the X server, for instance, are broadly enough applicable that they would make a whole lot of sense in a general purpose operating system? Yeah, um, right now there's a lot of stuff that's kind of hackish uh, put together to achieve that. So, for example, the X server we have does not, would not, would not work properly in a traditional desktop environment. Uh, however, we're trying to standardize all that and getting it uh, in, into a position where you can use all our components in SteamOS mode or, or in regular mode. Uh, it's worth it to note that some people have already uh, done, done that in some capacity. For example, there's an Ubuntu PPA that lets you install our kernel modules, uh, our improved uh, X Xbox controller, and the full SteamOS session side by side with your uh, desktop productivity session uh, using our Steam Comp Manager, uh, which is fully open source. There. They repackaged it, um, so you can you can get that full experience traditionally uh, next to a traditional Linux desktop today. Uh, it's just a little bit rough around the edges right now, and we're hopefully going to make it better in the future. There were any other questions, right? Yes. I mean, we'd love to be as close to upstream as we can, but we're not afraid to make changes when we need to. And if there's things that we change that make sense upstream, we're happy to work with right people make it happen. Um, I have a question regarding um, uh, libraries that developers can use. Do you have a list of compatible libraries with the same runtime? So as soon as uh, we produce a game, uh, it can also be made readily available on SteamOS and other Linux platforms that use Steam. 
Uh, the li well, you're saying what are the libraries in the Steam runtime? Is that the question? Yes. What libraries does it link to, for example? Yeah. Uh, like I, you can go up to the GitHub, and the Steam runtime is one of the things that's up there. Um, what's in there is the traditional X, OpenGL, audio stuff that you would expect. I mean, it's basically the the things that are in the runtime are the things that games are using today, and that's why they're in the runtime. There's some uh, some scripts up there as well that let you uh, monitor your application and see if there's anything that's using that's not in the runtime. So you could either correct that or, or work with us to add stuff into the runtime. It's not out of the question that we add stuff in. Uh, it's pretty hard for us to take stuff back out because that's that's the potential to break things. Does that answer your question? Yes. Just a quick comment in response to the point about using Steam on Debian. It's already in the non-free repository of Jesse uh, and, and Sid, so uh, while not on Wheezy, in subsequent versions of Debian, you can already uh, do Linux gaming, admittedly not with the various uh, alterations to the uh, uh, lower layers, but, uh, but if, they're, if they're not suitable for general use, I see why they're not there. So you can already do them side by side. I've done it. It works. Yeah, and Pierre and I had lunch with Michael Gilbert today as a packager for that, so we're trying to make it better for Steam and Debian. So, so two uh, two quick questions. One, uh, how are you looking at Wayland yet? <laughs> uh, we've we've looked at Wayland. Uh, right now, it's not there for us. Mm -hmm. When we look at Wayland and, and and they promise compatibility with X, and we now have hundreds and hundreds of games that depend on X. So when we look at Wayland, our perspective is, okay, is this going to break us or not? And if it is going to break us, that's kind of a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And if it's not going to break us, what does it give us? And right now, that equation is unknown. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> we and don't know. It doesn't appear to give us any direct benefits because we're really open GL focused. It's not going to do much there for us. Uh, and it just has some potential to break X compatibility across all the games and things we have. And I don't know how good their compatibility story is because it seems to be in flux a bit. Okay. And then my, my, my second quick question is, uh, have you considered better integration with Wine? Like, if, if I have Wine installed in a system, would it be possible to have Steam recognize that and let me install Windows applications? The problem with that is it's really uh, not Steam's job to be running a third-party app in a way it's not really ever designed or intended to be run. We can't guarantee anything app is going to run under Wine. We can't test it. We can't support it. If you bought a Windows game and it didn't run under Wine, whose fault is that? Is it Steam's? Is it the game division? It's not really a good position for us to be in. So, I, so are you um, do I have to? Uh, so you mentioned some of the a lot of the benefits of having a, a hackable platform, um, but I know that not all of it is. So I'm wondering if you could be more clear about which parts of it are still proprietary and what the motivation is for keeping them that way, given that you know, parts the benefits are that you talked about. Are, and a, a free the only market. thing that is not open source in SteamOS is the Steam client itself, and of course all the games. So that, why not the client? And do you have any plans to encourage more free software games in Steam? Um, I don't think we we've talked a little about open sourcing the line, but it, it, probably not going to happen. I don't think it, I don't see it happening. It's something we're actively developing. It's pretty proprietary. It's crucial to our business. The cost benefit ratio there doesn't seem to be right, in my opinion, to open source it at this point. There's a question on IRC. When is in-home streaming coming from Linux to Linux again? Coming, well, in-home streaming is already there on Linux. You can stream from... It used from to work and it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's streaming been, from Linux? Yeah, there's been some uh, some refactoring of the code uh, used so to Steam from Mac and Linux, but uh, it's being actively worked on at the moment. I don't know. Um, sorry, just 
this question is maybe a little bit trollish, but uh, <laughs> I Somebody apologize in advance. <laughs> um, so um, I know you're focusing on the living room experience uh, with with Steam, but uh, it's but does the Linux Steam client is going to proliferate through any any Linux desktop? Um, do you think that it would be an extremely attractive platform for proprietary um, software that's not necessarily games? You do sell some uh, non-games on the Windows part, but do you see that as an attractive platform where they would bypass the entire uh, packaging setup for, we have? In? For people to sell things that are not yes, games because Steam. We they do. have one thing that nobody else has: it's metrics. And it's very hard for a proprietary vendor to gauge the market, yeah. a Linux market. So we, we do have some things that are not games that are sold through Steam. Um, I, I'm probably not the right person to talk to. If you have such a thing, I could probably connect you to the right people to talk to. But we, we're not saying we only sell games. We do sell. Right now, I think it's mainly tools, right, for building games mm -hmm. that get sold through Steam. That's pretty popular. Um, and there's probably a few other things. I can't tell off the top of my head what they all are, but there's even a non-game section or something on Steam. Right. So, but, but it is the focus is mainly games. So you guys aren't going to open source the Steam client, which makes sense in some respect, but you guys are the gatekeepers to thousands of games. Do you ever foresee uh, the future where open source games can sort of be like presented in a way that and actually sort of promote the fact that they are open source or free uh, and like you can actually dig into the game's open source right out of the Steam client, like maybe like a right click menu option, view source? If the, games, <laughs> if the game view supports it. The game? Sure, uh, yeah. I guess we could do that. I, I haven't seen a huge demand for it. <laughs> I mean, there's the whole modding community. It just happens sort of behind yeah. Valve's no, back, essentially. It doesn't really, like, if it's I know you guys have I mean, There's a lot of stuff we do to enable mods specifically. Sure, sure. It's a big part of the, the open platform, you know, we want to deliver is so people can mod. Uh, all kinds of, yeah, mod. There's all sorts of different ways you can mod stuff. And you look at a game like Skyrim, and the mods are, like, almost way better than the original game was. Right, right. <laughs> I like Scar. Well, you told us uh, how you use. You, you told us how you use uh, Debian. Um, you told us how you distract Debian engineers by giving away free licenses. <laughs> um, but I couldn't find any edges in your workflow diagrams leading back f from SteamOS to Debian. So, how contribute you back to Debian? Yeah. Um, we pushed a few bug fixes we found in, in uh, apt and uh, unattended upgrades up. Um, uh, so far, that's been mainly uh, bug fix stuff that's gone upwards. And, and uh, I know we did the app stuff. Um, was it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> On to the conference. That's right. So if you take, oh, yeah. um, if you take all the for example, the Mesa work with, with funding, uh, that goes directly back upstream into Mesa, which makes its way back into Debian. Uh, there's a lot of other projects where uh, we've been contributing to. I mean, the kernel patches that we were mentioning before, that also will trickle back into Debian at some point, uh, whenever it makes it upstream and whenever Debian picks up that kernel release. Uh, we're big proponents of keeping it that way, uh, not only because it benefits everyone, but because it makes our lives easier when we want to switch to Jesse or whatever is the next stable Debian release. Um, so it's it's definitely on our radar to do that kind of stuff. And we are looking for other ways we can help the community. Um, if you have suggestions, please let me know. Uh, so, for example, id Software is famous for releasing stuff initially as proprietary and then some years later uh, re-releasing stuff as open source. Uh, how easy would it be for someone who wrote a game for Steambox to later open source it? For, 
for, I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking. It's a, I mean, it's open sourcing a game is just like open sourcing anything else. You got to make sure you have all the rights and the copyrights and. Oh well, I, I mean. Or I, I mean, is there, uh, is there any if reason? you're dis distributing through the Steam system, is there like extra stuff that you have to do that's difficult to rip out in any way? I don't think so. The only thing is the Steamworks SDK, um, but you, you, I mean, as long as you don't distribute the uh, the actual library uh, that we have, uh, everything else is and fine. Then, right, there's a library that integrates with Steam for doing friends and you know achievements and things like that that you would probably have to rip out, but it wouldn't make sense outside of Steam anyway. So there's um, there's not a lot of deep integration between SteamOS games and and SteamOS because all these work all these games work in Steam for Linux and most of the time standalone too. Um, so so that isn't a big issue. You had a question. Yeah. Yeah, so coming back to the question of how, how Valve gives back, in case people aren't aware, I will let you know that in addition to the various things they've talked about, and, and it's always, of course, good to challenge companies about how they do contribute back to Debian. Valve is sponsoring uh, DebConf this year. They are one of our gold sponsors, so thank you very much for that, John. And we got great placement on the t-shirt, too. I'm pretty happy about that. That's good. <laughs> so um, one question I have for you is regarding uh, your diagram of, of packages flowing from Debian to, to Steam, where uh, my understanding is that you're, you're currently your Alchemist beta and your Alchemist channels are both based on, uh, well, currently on Wheezy, and you talked about how you would have a later release that would be based on Jesse. Um, have you considered uh, pulling in from SID and tracking Unstable for during the development phases, and um, why did you choose not to go that way? We I, we may have a package or two that we've pulled from Sid. I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm looking at Pierre Lou, but I should be looking at myself. There there are some. There's nothing philosophically we have against pulling from newer newer stuff. It's just it's easier for us if the stuff's not changing out from under us as much. It's purely a matter of making our lives easier to build on something more stable than less. Sorry, so uh, was your question whether we should like start experimenting with Sid to uh, lay the foundation for our next release. Right. So I guess the question is, should the beta channel? Well, so the the way your beta channel works, I guess, is it's um, it's solely based on on pulling new versions in from the stable release that you're tracking. And should there be a channel? Yes, I guess I would say, uh, sh should there be some sort of experimental channel that that uh, users can start uh, looking forward to that would yeah. be that would be tracking uh, Sid or even. It's purely, it purely would be just a bunch of work for us to track. I mean, we basically at that point have three different releases we had to manage rather than just one. And one is, is keeping us plenty busy. So, you know, if we had an infinite number of resources, maybe we could have, you know, Alchemist, something else, something else that tracked, you know, Wheezy, Jesse, and Sid. But we just don't have the manpower for that, and it's not clear what the benefit would be. We'll bite that bullet when we have to. So, in terms of the libraries that are currently included in the runtime, what kind of factors go into making that decision? For instance, if I had an application that I wanted to distribute through Steam, but it relied on another 30 libraries from different platform components, would that be a case where you would just willingly add those to the runtime, or would that be a case where I would have to attempt to refactor my application? We're not averse to adding stuff to the runtime where it makes sense. Um, some things would be rather than, you know, adding, you know, refactoring application might be bundling that. We see that, for instance, with Mono or Java-based applications. They'll just bundle that with their application, so it's part of their uh, depot, their application, and they ship that dependency along with themselves. Um, but if there's something that you know a lot of games have in common that makes sense for us to add to the runtime, we recently added support for a Clang and for the newer version of GCC to take advantage of the C++11 stuff. Uh, that was a pretty high demand from some of our developers wanted that New York compiler, so we've updated the runtime with that. All right, I'm getting the one minute sign, so right, one more question. Just a comment. Um, I'm looking at the SteamOS patches here against Debian. Um, a lot of them 
don't have any rationale in the changelog. For example, uh, IP tables, you're disabling the test suite. I don't know why, but uh, just to comment, more co more rationale in the change logs would be awesome for okay. Debian people looking at the patches. I think we disabled it because it wasn't working in our system, our environment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of the, we we build these things in the CH root, and a lot of the tests kind of have some weird side effects on our build system. I know PHP is notorious for that. So whenever we build PHP, we have to reboot machines and stuff. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. If you have any other questions, I'll be around the rest of the day. So thanks for your help. <laughs>